So what happens if we have excess glucose in the body? Well, if there's excess glucose in the body, we should store it. So how do we store excess glucose? Well, that excess glucose enters into the liver, then we store it in the form of this glycogen. So we would take the six carbon carbohydrate glucose molecule, it would enter, and then it would bond, and then we would store it in this form of glycogen. So what does glycogen actually look like? Well, the actual structure looks like this. And we see it's simply just a storage form of glucose, and that's how we store glucose. We it enters into our liver and it's stored in the form of this glycogen. It's just glycogen, this glycogen molecule is just a bunch of these glucose molecules covalently linked together. So notice there are two types of bond, bonds in this glycogen molecule. We have these 1,4 alpha linkages, see all these 1,4 alpha linkages, and these 1,6 alpha linkages. So why are these called 1,4 alpha linkages? Well, we know with glucose, this is carbon 1, this is carbon 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. This is an arbitrary, this is the convention. So we know glucose, we have these numbered carbons. So we see with this linkage, where we link these two glucose molecules together, we're linking carbon 1 with carbon 4. So that's why it's called a 1,4 alpha linkage. But notice with this bond, we're linking carbon 1 with carbon 6. So that's why it's called a 1,6 alpha linkage. But the key point is that these 1,4 alpha linkages creates a linear chain. And again, it would be these 1,4 alpha linkages that would create more. If we added more glucose molecules, we would add them in this linear fashion. So the linear uh, part is made by these 1,4 alpha linkages. However, whenever we want to make branches, we start a branch with one of these 1,6 alpha linkages. So maybe we wanted to do another branch. We would start that branch with another 1,6 alpha linkage. So we see we have this linear part with all these 1,4 alpha linkages, but we wanted to make this branch. So we start the branch with one of these 1,6 alpha linkages. And once we've done that, now we use these 1,4 alpha linkages to create that linear chain. So again, we have these two major types of bonds. But something's important to realize is why is it necessary to create these branches? What is the utility of having branches? Why can't we just have these 1,4 alpha linkages with the linear chain of glucose, or of glycogen? Well, remember, what is the purpose of this glycogen? It's a storage form of glucose. So, and why is it important to store glucose? Because it's important to make sure we always have glucose in our bloodstream to keep the brain happy. The brain needs glucose to function properly and it gets its glucose from the bloodstream. So it's important to make sure we have glucose in the bloodstream at all times. But what happens if we haven't eaten a meal for a couple of hours and our blood glucose concentrations start to drop? Well, fortunately, we have this stored glucose in the form of glycogen. So now we can use these glucose molecules and release them to restore those blood glucose concentrations to keep the brain happy. However, now maybe I'll ask a question. Which glycogen chain would be better, having this kind of glycogen chain or this kind of glycogen chain? Well, notice with this glycogen chain, we have one branch. So therefore, if we need glucose, we could release two glucose molecules at a time. We would first release these two, then we would release these two. So with one branch, we can release two glucose molecules at a time. However, when we have this glycogen molecule with a lot of different branches, a lot of these 1,6 alpha branches, now we have a lot of these termini. So now if we need glucose, we could all instantaneously at one moment chop this one, this one, this one, this, this, and this off all at the same time, releasing six glucose molecules. So the more branches we have, the more of these free ends we have available to release glucose molecules. So this can very quickly release a lot of glucose, while this one can only release two glucose molecules at a time. So that's the utility of creating these branches, and we can only create these branches, branches with those 1,6 alpha linkages. So now... Something else important to realize is this glycogen chain has a polarity, while this end is referred to as the reducing end. It's a reducing end because it's a reducing sugar, and we talked about that in, in my previous video. I have a link of it below. But again, we have a polarity where while this side is called the reducing end, while this side is called the non-reducing end. It's the non-reducing end because these are non-reducing sugars. And again, I talked about them in my previous video. But that's just important to realize. We, we, we have this polarity, and, and again, so, so they're, they're not uh, the same, essentially. But something important to realize is let's say we, we, we have this stored glucose, but we need to release some glucose. We release that glucose from this non-reducing end. It's these non-reducing ends where we release glucose. But maybe also let's say we have excess glucose and we want to store it. 
Where do we store that excess glucose? We add it onto the non-reducing end. So it's this non-reducing end where all the interesting stuff is happening. That's where we're adding glucose molecules. We add it to the non-reducing end. And that's where we chop off and release glucose molecules on this non-reducing end. So again, we have that polarity. But now, let's say where we want to do an example where, let's say we haven't eaten a meal for a couple of hours, so our blood glucose concentrations have dropped. We know that's bad, so we need to restore those blood glucose concentrations. We need to dump glucose into the bloodstream to restore that blood glucose concentrations. So how do we do that? We know we chop them off on this non-reducing end. Exactly how do we do that? Well, we need the help of an enzyme but essentially what that enzyme does is it takes one of these inorganic phosphates and we go through a very simple mechanism. All that happens is this carbon one and we have this oxygen. Essentially, this oxygen nucleophilically attacks this carbon one. We know it has these lone pairs of electrons, which I'm being lazy and not drawing, but we have those lone pairs of electrons nucleophilically attack this carbon one. When it does that, it forms a bond. It would form a bond. And when it attacks and forms that bond, we know this bond would break and these electrons would fall on the oxygen. So again, notice what we're doing. We're forming a bond and we're breaking a bond. So if we did that, we'd form something like this. So we've done it. We've effectively chopped off this glucose molecule. And, and now we have, we have this 1,6-phosphate uh, 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 glucose molecule. But now we need to do a couple more steps. So now we have this glucose 1-phosphate. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, this was a glucose 1-phosphate. So now we have this glucose 1-phosphate molecule that we released. So now we need to go through another step where we take that phosphate, which again, this is carbon 1. So we have this phosphate on carbon 1. That's why it's called glucose 1-phosphate. So we need to take this phosphate and transfer it to this carbon 6. This was carbon 6, so we need to transfer it. And when we do that, we create this molecule, this molecule, which is called glucose 6-phosphate. Now we have this glucose 6-phosphate. Now we go through another reaction where we essentially get rid of this phosphate. And now we have free glucose. So that's how we do it. That's how we had, remember, originally we had this glucose molecule. We had this glucose molecule that we wanted to release. So how we did it, again, we said that phosphate attacked, forming that bond, breaking this bond. When we did that, we formed this, remember, glucose 1-phosphate because it's on this carbon 1 that has the phosphate. So we formed this glucose 1-phosphate. Then we go through these other uh, reactions where we eventually form glucose, which can now enter into the bloodstream. And it can also be used for whatever purposes we may need glucose for. So that's how we release these glucose molecules. Again, we do it on the non-reducing end, and that's how we release these glucose molecules. However, what if we want to add a glucose molecule? For example, maybe we've just eaten a meal. So now we have a lot of excess glucose. So now we want to store some of that glucose in this glycogen. How do we do that? Well, again, we know we store that glucose on the non-reducing end. And how exactly do we do that? Well, first we need to look at this carbon-1. This carbon-1, which is right next to this oxygen. So now we have this carbon-1, which is also referred to as the anomeric carbon. And we take its hydroxyl group, and we need to react with this hydroxyl group to make the hydroxyl a better leaving group. So now we've made a better leaving group. Now this oxygen is a better leaving group. Now that it's a good leaving group, we can have these lone pairs of electrons scooch down. When they scooch down, they form a double bond. And when that double bond is formed, now we break this bond, and these electrons fall on this oxygen. And we can do that. These electrons can scooch down forming that double bond because we can break this bond with these electrons falling on this oxygen because this is a good leaving group. Remember, we made a good leaving group. So now the electrons scooch down, form that double bond. Now we break this bond. These electrons fall on this leaving group. And now we're left with this compound. So now we have this very reactive, this positively charged reactive glucose, uh, or, or it's the glucose without that, that hydroxyl. And this is very reactive because this carbon is very electrophilic. Why is it so electrophilic? Because we know oxygen is very electronegative. So this oxygen is stealing a lot of electron density. And not just that, we have this formal charge of positive 1. So we have a, a strong electron deficiency on this carbon, so it's very electrophilic, so it's very reactive. So now these lone pairs of electrons on this oxygen can nucleophilically attack. When it nucleophilically attacks this carbon electrophile, we form a bond, and once we form that bond, we push these pi electrons up onto this oxygen. When we do that, we'd essentially be left with this product. So now we've done it. We've added that glucose molecule onto this glycogen. And now we could add more glucose. And again, it's just a, so this glycogen is just a storage form of glucose. It just has a lot of these glucose molecules as a storage form for when we need it later.